You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we are about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red Tic Tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers. And in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. Let's get into some unusual news from this last week. There have been quite a few attempts to build an effective invisibility cloak over the last few years, with modern technology finally beginning to catch up with the science fiction staple of rendering an object invisible to the naked eye. This latest attempt from Invisibility Shield Co. is undeniably impressive, offering a freestanding shield that uses an array of precision lenses to deflect the light from the person or object standing immediately behind it while filling the space with the background scenery. Unlike some invisibility cloak solutions, this one works without any power source whatsoever and is lightweight, enabling a single person to pick it up and move it around with ease. While it doesn't offer total invisibility, the real potential comes from imagining how this could be used to camouflage tanks planes, or other equipment on the battlefield, or to make it difficult for the enemy to spot soldiers hiding nearby. I remember being young and always struggling with deciding if I wanted to have the superpower to fly or to be invisible. While flying is amazing, if I ever wanted to leave a really embarrassing moment or steal cookies from the cabinet, as a child, the superpower of invisibility sounds like one of the most perfect traits one could possess next to flying. In other news, a report has revealed that the Tory government, which is the British version of traditionalism under Margaret Thatcher, once planned to hunt for the Loch Ness Monster using trained dolphins. According to declassified secret documents, which were first reported on in the early 2000s and recently resurfaced online, within days of the 1979 election, officials proposed importing the bottlenose dolphins from America and fitting them with high-tech equipment to hunt Loch Ness. They agreed if the specially trained animals could find Nessie, it would benefit local tourism. Under the provisions of the Wildlife and Countryside Act 1981, it is illegal to snare, shoot, or blow up the monster. Interesting. What is this really saying? Is the, are these people really interested in the Loch Ness? Do they believe it to be true? Well, with the news out of the way, let me talk about my guests. L.A. Marzulli is an author, lecturer, and filmmaker. He has written 12 books, including the Nephilim Trilogy, which made the CBA bestsellers list. His new series, On the Trail of the Nephilim, uncovers startling evidence that there has been a massive cover-up of what he believes are the remains of the Nephilim. 
the giants mentioned in the Bible. Marzulli is a Frank supernaturalist who has lectured on the subject of UFOs, the Nephilim, and ancient prophetic texts. Then after the interview with Mr. Marzulli, I will be speaking to Chris Plain, writer for The Debrief, on his recent groundbreaking articles. So stay tuned for the end of the show. Mr. Marzulli, thank you for joining us on Shifting the Paradigm. How are you? I'm really good. Thank you. And uh, calling me Mr. Marzulli makes me sound so old. But, How uh, shall I address it. you? L.A. is fine. You got it, Mr. L.A. So you are a filmmaker, lecturer, author, and researcher. So before we get into the details of your work, can you tell us about what got you started on your journey into the type of research that you do? Well, well, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a long story, but I'll keep it short and pithy, as they say. Um, I'm, I'll be 72 years old this year. Okay, so I grew up with the Beatles. Um, I was 13 when they when they hit the scene. And what people don't understand is about two or three years after the Beatles were, were there, I was about 16 or 17 at the time, uh, they really embraced Eastern mysticism. And so all of a sudden, everything uh, Eastern mystical I was into, very much so. Now, I had seen a UFO when I was 12 years old. I was walking with three other boys at Camp Horseshoe, Rising Sun, Maryland. Oh, Mr. I could take you there today and show it to you. And we're walking up this trail and the league guy goes, wow, what's that? And he points and the other two boys go, wow, what is that? And I go, where? And they go, there. And it's a classic silver disc covering with the sun glinting off of it. And we watched this thing for, I don't know, 20 seconds. And it shot up like this, bam, straight up in the air, out of sight. That changed my paradigm that day. Now, I wouldn't be able to articulate that as a 12-year-old. But it changed my paradigm. It, told, it said something's going on here. I'm not sure what. I want to get to the bottom of it. So fast forward 13, the Beatles come out. By the time I'm 16 or 17, this massive wave of occult-type literature comes into vogue. It's, it's according to Russ Dizdar, uh, a good friend and battle buddy who passed away you know, just last year in December. Um, it was the largest influx since the 20s of occult literature. And so everything Eastern mystical came in. I had abandoned my, my so-called Christian roots as a Catholic. I just left the church after I was confirmed. There was nothing there for me. It seemed like a dead religion. And I began to search and look and search some more. Uh, when I was 18, my girlfriend, who I'd been in, in love with all through high school, was killed in a hit-and-run automobile accident. She was walking on the side of a road and uh, snapped her neck, broke her neck. She was 16. So that led me into, if there's a God, why, why did this happen? If there's an afterlife, what does it look like? And I had already dabbled in Eastern mysticism. I had seen my first UFO. So I began to read voraciously. Um, I did vision quests. I read Carlos Castaneda's vision quests, uh, of Yaki knowledge and all that, and then went out and did it. Uh, I was looking for God. I'm looking for something. And I had a lot of bizarre experiences. A lot of uh, things happened. When I was 21, I joined the ashram uh, under Guru Maharaji. Once again, Eastern mysticism. I saw this little 14-year-old boy who came to Philadelphia. I was 21. And I was completely blown away by him. And I really thought that he was God incarnate at the time. And I was in the ashram for three years. My third eye was open. I heard divine music, supposedly divine music. I tasted divine nectar. All these things are, are counterfeits. As you, once you're in for a while and you come out of it for a while, we begin to learn very quickly that these are counterfeits. And so I became agnostic. I'm 24 years old. I was an agnostic and still dabbled. I did vision quests. Um, I had spirit guide encounters, all sorts of crazy stuff. And when I was uh, 30 years old, I was reading a book by uh, David Hunt. And in the back of that book, there's a little prayer to give your life to Jesus. I'm alone in my room. No one's no twisting my arm. I'm not being hit in the head of the Bible. I just said, look, if you're real, come into my life. And that's 42 years ago this June. He came in, things have never been the same, <laughs> and they never will be again, that's for certain. Um, I was pulled out of the enemy's camp, and they didn't like that. 
So for the first three years of my walk uh, with the Lord, I was celibate. I had two mentors uh, who I con contacted and inputted me. Um, if the church was open, I was there. I read the, the Bible voraciously, cover to cover to cover to cover to cover, in-depth Bible studies. And I, I after three years, um, the Lord said, okay, it's time to start dating. Go find your wife. And three months later, I was engaged to Peggy. We've now been married 37 years. It'll be 38 years this September. And um, I was, became a worship leader at a church. And about 10 years into it as a Christian, that's when the Lord kind of tapped me on the shoulder and said, hey, remember all that stuff that you used to be into? Well, we're going to look at it from a Christian point of view. So I became and I started to, I've always been a gracious reader. But the book that changed my life was the book called The Omega Conspiracy by Dr. I.D.E. Thomas. Um, he was the one, the man that that talked about the Nephilim, talked about UFOs, talked about how they connect to each other. And I reread and read that book countless times, as well as the books that he referenced, specifically the Book of Enoch, Jubilees, others. And um, that became the nexus of my work. I received an honorary doctorate from Dr. I.D.E. Thomas. I think it was 2002 or three. Uh, the first book of the Nephilim trilogy had already been published. And uh, Dr. Thomas was a mentor to me. And I received an honorary doctorate from him. And when, when he put that mantle over me, it was like Elijah and Alicia. It was just like, oh, I see. And he, he passed away several years after that. I think if you were alive today, and he'd be 100 years old, actually 101 this year, um, he would be blown away by what we've done, how we've pushed the ball further down, down the field, as it were, if I can use that analogy. So my, my roots are in the occult, which gives me a very unique perspective because I've been both sides of the fence. So I know what the counterfeit looks like because I, I lived it. I was there. And then I know what the real thing looks like. When a person becomes born again, spirit filled uh, with Jesus as their Lord and Savior, it's not what you think it is. Where the first time a living God begins to speak to a person, it's it's mind boggling and not in an audible voice. Although I have heard audible voices, but very rare. It's usually one word. So it's just one word like that. Most of the time, it's just an impression that comes in. And I know it's the Lord's voice because I've walked with him for 42 years. So that's basically, that's the journey. Uh, now there's 13 books and 21 films. <laughs> Go figure. It seems like your life has just been filled with so much. It's it's amazing. And you mentioned the Nephilim. For my younger viewers and those who may not be familiar, can you give an overview about what or who the Nephilim are? The Nephilim uh, were and are um, the progeny between fallen angels and the women of earth, creating this hybrid entity known as the Nephilim. So here's, here's the passage of scripture that if we don't understand, we'll, we'll never get to. And folks, if you want to really get into this, the, it's the first episode on our show on PTL, which airs, uh, but you can just go, you can download the app on your phone, PTL. Look for Amitrail of the Nephilim as the very first episode. It's broadcast quality. It's 30 minutes long. I get into it in, in massive detail. If we don't understand Genesis 3.15, then we don't understand the rest of our Bibles. Because that little vignette uh, in Genesis 3.15 is the pre-incarnate Christ in the garden with Adam and Eve. And Jesus says uh, to the dragon who's also there, your seed will be at war, at enmity, with the seed the offspring of the woman. He, the one coming from the woman, will crush your head. You will bruise his heel. That's it. If we don't come to terms with Genesis 3.15, in my opinion, the rest of the Bible makes no sense at all. Because we don't understand what happens when we get to Genesis 6 and the Nephilim are on the earth. We don't come to grips and and, and understand what, what happens with um, the Tower of Babel. Why, why is that going on at the Tower of Babel? What happens with Abraham and the five kings? What happened with Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Why is Sodom and Gomorrah completely destroyed? Why is it that um, 
uh, the mandate comes down to wipe everybody out in the promised land, men, women, and children. So we are looking at something which is absolutely incredible, yet it's so tatamount or paramount to our discussion, so germane to it, that unless we get our heads around it and we understand what happened way back in Genesis 3.15, the rest of the biblical narrative, we have a lot of trouble. When we get the passages like Sodom and Gomorrah, we sit there and, and, and we scratch our heads. And we go, I don't know what I'm looking at here. Why, why is God destroying the earth with the flood? Because the Nephilim are on the earth. Your seed, your offspring, will be at war, at enmity, with the offspring of, of the woman. He, the one coming from the woman, will crush your head, crush the dragon's head. We know that happens at Calvary. So that's it's really imperative for people to understand that again, if if you if you have access to the PTL app, it's a free app. Just go there, look at the shows. I'm about halfway down on the trail of a Nephilim. It's episode one. If you're at all interested, it's a really an in-depth study into the whole Genesis 315. According to Hebraic and works such as the Book of Enoch, the Nephilim were giants who did acts of great evil. Have you found evidence of the Nephilim in other cultures across the world, maybe under other names? Not necessarily under other names, but we know that they were there. That's our whole series on the trail of the Nephilim is based on the idea, the concept that there, uh, there's evidence of this and that evidence can be found. It's, it's global. It's everywhere from, from the Levant, uh, Israel, all throughout the Middle East, all throughout Europe, and even in the Americas, in North America, South America, Central America, it's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Uh, not so much in Africa, although in certain areas there are some remnants of them. In other words, when Joshua and Caleb pressed the conquest of, of the Holy Land about 3,500 years ago, okay, um, there was this diaspora. The giant tribe, the Nephilim tribes, fled the area. Where did they go? There was a stele on the, on the northern coast of Africa, discovered by, um, uh, the name escapes me, I'm sorry. But he, he translated it. And, it. and that stele, carved in stone, stele is a column of stone. So it, it's carved in the stone. We are they who fled from the face of Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. I'll say it again. We are they who fled from the face of Joshua, the son of Nun, Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. We are they who fled from the face of Joshua the robber, the son of Nun. That's, that's in your face biblical. Who are they? Why would they flee? Well, we already know who fled. They are the Nephilim tribes, the Zanzamim, the Emims, the Nephilim, the Raphaim, the Anakim, the Horites. They're all names for Nephilim tribes. They're there in the promised land. And Joshua's mandate is to wipe them out. Why? Because they're not human. They are the soulless ones. And they are bent. Uh, they're incredibly evil, in my opinion. Incredibly evil. Have you come across any evidence that the descendants of the Nephilim are around today? Well, in our, in our Watchers 10 show, we interviewed two men who had contact with what we call the Kandahar Giant. Um, the, the powers that be did not like us doing that. I was threatened by the deep state three different ways, uh, basically told to back off on the Kandahar giant. Don't, we don't like that uh, because we, we were hitting, this wasn't ancient history, this was new. 2001, this man is with a platoon and they, they've been dispatched because another platoon has gone missing. So the next day they, they're out on a search party to find out what happened to the other platoon. They round the bend on this, this trail. They're up over, over a canyon, about a thousand foot drop, almost like cliff, which is maybe 30, 40 feet wide, like a plateau on the cliff. And above the cliff is a cave. And they see bits of what looks like bone and human flesh and parts of radio. And it's like, something's not good here. And as they begin to examine further this giant, 12-footer comes screaming out of the cave, brandishing a large spear, a lance, reddish hair, double rows of teeth, stunk to high heaven. It smelled like after they killed the thing, 
uh, the shooter told us that it smelled like rotted flesh. So it's very, very unpleasant. And um, what, what's amazing is they, they, they freeze, just put, they're all, and who wouldn't? It's like your worst nightmare coming true. You know, 12 footer coming out of a cage, really big guy. And this one guy, Dan, starts to run towards him, the giant, and opens fire. And uh, the giant moves with such agility and speed that it catches all of them off by, you know, off guard. And he impales Dan and hoists him up and, uh, you know, bellows and screams and yells. And someone finally says, shoot him in the head, shoot him in the head. So the rest of the platoon just empty their, empty their weapons. Basically, they almost decapitate him. And the thing falls to the ground. Dan dies. Chopper comes in, takes it. They're flown back, and they're, they write their report. Then they're told to rewrite their report. So, okay, that's a tall yarn. We interviewed a man who was stationed at the same province, same base in, in, in Afghanistan, the Kandahar province. And uh, he was there, and the rumors about the Kandahar giant were everywhere. But you were told not to talk about it. So we went and we filmed him, uh, and of course, anonymously. Both men were anonymous. So it's real. In my opinion, there was a hit piece recently that was on some, some website, and they never contacted, they referred to me in, in the story, but they didn't contact me. Well, I'm, I'm an open book. All you got to do is shoot me an email. No one ever did that. So there's a reason for that. It was a hit piece. Why six years after we published Watchers 10, six, seven years later, are they trying to, you know, spin the story about the Kandahar giant, that it's all just one big hoax or, you know, funny business or whatever. It's not. So anyway, that's, that's, um, that's something about the Kandahar giant. That's kind of an unbelievable story with such great detail. In your latest book called Counter Move, How the Nephilim Returned After the Flood, published in 2021, you state there was a mistranslation of the Hebrew term Nephilim, which you explain in your book. Can you explain from your research what the correct translation is? Well, the the sons of God are the Beneha Elohim. And so the Nephilim uh, by giants were, you know, part of that. Some of the Nephilim were giants, but not all of them were. And the idea that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, the sons of God are not the godly line of Seth. It's Beneha Elohim, which always refers to the angelic hosts, whether good or evil, it makes no difference. So that's what we clarify in the book, who the sons of God were and who the offspring uh, were the Nephilim, part fallen angel, part female from Earth, earthly woman, combined together to make this hybrid entity known as the Nephilim. When you state it like that, it does make more sense. In the book of Genesis, it states that in order to wipe out the evil Nephilim, a great flood engulfed the Earth, saving only Noah, his family, and the animals on board the Ark. Does your research corroborate that story as it led to the demise of the Nephilim, or were there survivors? Well, that's the thing. There, there are no survivors. Uh, some people, and the reason why I wrote the book Counter Move was to set the record straight that somehow one of Noah's, you know, sons' wives entered the ark and had carried the Nephilim gene. I don't believe that for a minute. How is that possible? She would be Nephilim herself. And you don't think Noah would know that? It makes no sense. And that's where the Lord led me into uh, the book of Enoch, which I realize is not part of our Bible. But Jude quotes the book of Enoch. So surely we can appreciate what the book of, of Enoch tells us. At least we can appreciate its historicity, how it reveals what may have happened. And the book of Enoch is sort of an opening, open window into the antediluvian world. Well, Enoch tells us that this group of watcher angels descended in the days of Jared on Mount Hermon. And their leader, Semyaza, basically stated that this. He said, I fear that you will agree not to do this thing, and I alone shall have to bear the penalty of this great sin. 
And the Holy Spirit showed me very, very clearly that this was a suicide mission. Now, that passage of Scripture has been there and available for anyone who wants to look at it for thousands of years. But it was hidden. And I'm not, I'm not that smart. I was shown that. It was a download. The Lord showed it to me. And that became the nexus of counter move. It was a suicide mission. They knew what they were going to do, and they did it anyway. L.A., we're coming towards a break. We'll be right back. Alternative talk you can trust. The X. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi, I'm Micah Hanks, and let me tell you something. I support Christina Gomez as a Patreon subscriber, and here's why you should, too. She brings all of her unique insights to a whole new generation and all while she's also going through college. Listen, support Christina, become a Patreon subscriber today. You won't regret it. Hey there, it's Christina. Did you know you can get access to an exclusive extra segment of additional questions and answers with all of my guests, as well as behind the scene videos and photos? Ever wonder how I turn my small college dorm apartment into a studio where I can shoot new videos or set up lighting and backdrops for my show or what camera I use? Yep, that video is there too, where I explain as I go along and also give the story of how I learned to do special video effects and editing. You can get access to all of that and much more by joining my Patreon supporters club. You'll be helping by supporting this channel, my research, and production costs, as well as investing in new shows coming soon. Starting from as little as $5 a month, there are several tiers you can choose from that suit your budget, and each tier carries extra perks and benefits. Join my Patreon club and become a supporter today. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Gold loves chaos uncertainty and disarray history shows us what gold does when people aren't sure aren't sure about the government the stock market their jobs or their retirement savings our national debt is skyrocketing gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover so what can you do right now to protect yourself call united gold group we offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours are you worried about the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. You're listening to the UNX Network, KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. What is that? A deer? I can't tell. Is that a bear? Wait, is that a person? At night, your vision drastically changes. Imagine thermal imaging and the ability to see clearly up to 1,000 yards at night. That ability is a reality with AGM Global Vision, offering high-quality thermal and night vision optics. Get crisp and clear images that are Wi-Fi compatible, recordable, and storable. AGM Global Vision has an extensive range of quality-made rifle scopes, clip-on systems, spotting scopes, binoculars, goggles, lasers, and infrared illumination. 
Get the edge at night with crystal clear sight. Call 928-333-4300 or visit agmglobalvision.com. Use promo code TSL and get 10% off. That's agmglobalvision.com. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Welcome back. With me today is my guest, L.A. Marzulli. We were talking about your book, Counter Move. You also mentioned the possibility of supernatural intervention with the genome of the human race. Can you explain what kind of supernatural interventions you're referring to? Well, once again, this is the, the commingling of the seed. This is why if we don't understand Genesis 3.15, when, when, when you ask a question like that, we now, because of this interview, your listeners has, have a basis. They have a baseline. Genesis 3.15 is the baseline that the seed of a dragon will be at war at enmity with the seed of the woman, offspring. And the offspring of the dragon happens three chapters later in Genesis 6. I mean, that's what we see. Hard to believe, but that's what happened, which results in a global flood. They return in the same way that, the, that they got here the first time. They just show up. But they know the penalty for what they do. These fallen angels were chained in dark, gloomy dungeons. So the book of Jude talks about the fallen angels. Uh, that, that are chained in gloomy dungeons. They left their first estate, okay? That's a huge hint. They left their first estate, and now they're chained in gloomy dungeons. What you will find interesting, and we talk about this in the book, Counter Move, is that when Jesus, after he died on the cross, and he's absolutely dead, he descends to the lower parts of, of the earth. We know that from Peter. And he preaches to the the angels the fallen angels that are there and in my opinion he basically says no jailbreak you're not getting out because they figured that they were going to win the war that they were going to stop the seed the proto-evangelium the idea of the messiah coming from the seed of the woman they were going to stop all that but they didn't and they tried over and over and over and over and over again it didn't work so finally and this is why the enemy is trying to kill jesus from birth You'll notice that when Jesus is born and the wise men come, Jesus is about two or three years old at this point. The wise men show up and, you know, what does Herod do? He kills all the children. What is it, four years or three years and under? They all die. because. And this is the work of the dragon. The dragon wants to kill the proto-evangelium. The, the dragon wants to kill the seed of the woman, which will eventually crush his head. And so he sets about it in every way possible. But with the cross, he doesn't understand the cross. He thinks, finally, I'm getting rid of this guy. But he doesn't understand that the blood sacrifice that Jesus pours out himself willingly, no man takes it from him. He pours it out willingly. He could have gotten out of it numerous times. He just didn't. So he dies for us. And then the Nephilim go away as we know them. But then Jesus utters... Before the crucifixion, he gives us he gives us a clue. It'll be like the days of Noah when I return. Well, what is what are the days of Noah? What differentiates the days of Noah? Well, one of the differentiations is the presence of the fallen angels and these hybrid entities known as the Nephilim. So that makes us wonder: Are they here? And that's why the Kandahar giant is so relevant. When you say Jesus descended to the lower part of the earth, do you mean like hell, like in another realm or dimension? It would be called Tartarus. Tartarus or Tartarus, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It's We don't know where that is, uh, but it's the lower parts. Uh, it's not hell, but it's a, it's a gloomy, dark, dark dungeon far below in, somewhere in the earth someplace. I realize that that sounds pretty strange. Um, I never want to go there. I don't want to have a guided tour there. I don't want to see it for a minute. But that's where he was. And according to Bollinger, who we quote in the book, Counter Move, um, it's a proclamation. When Jesus is there in front of the angels who are chained, and that opens up a whole, a whole you know, plethora of questions. 
you know, how are they chained? We, we don't know. Are they chained with just regular chains? I doubt it. There's something else going on. But they are chained. They're forbidden to get out. So Bollinger writes that when, when Jesus shows up there, it's a proclamation. He basically is saying this, that there is no jailbreak. You're not getting out. This is it. I got the keys right here. I won. Game over. And then everything just changes and shifts after that. L.A., aside from your book, you made an Internet series called The Watchers. This and the term The Observers has come up repeatedly in the UFO research field, in abduction cases and with the men in black. What do the Watchers mean to you? Are they the Nephilim, aliens, or something else? And can you give an overview of the series? Yeah, the Watchers, um, the watchers are a class of angelic beings, entities very powerful. They can manipulate space, time, matter, and energy. Our Watchers series, there's 11 films in the series. Um, it was done, Richard Shaw, the late Richard Shaw, he passed away three years ago this summer, unbelievable. And we did 11 films together. Rick was the director. Uh, I was the host and we both produced it ourselves. And uh, it was widely uh, seen. A lot of people love, love the series. And um, we had a good run at it. And I really miss Rick. I, I miss him. He's a good friend and uh, life is unpredictable and short and, and can turn on a dime. But the series gets in everything from things like this, like the Shroud of Turin. That's a picture of what uh, the face on the shroud looks like. Black Eyed Kids, UFOs. Um, and everything else in, in between. It was just uh, anything that had to do with the supernatural, Rick and I were there. And uh, we did, again, Kandahar Giant, great, great stuff. Um, Planet X, we delved into that. So we, we were all over the map with that series. And it, it was a good series and uh, people really enjoyed it. And it's a shame Rick had to leave the planet so early, but uh, he's with the Lord and he's gloating. <laughs> It is always amazing to have a partner in crime during this fascinating research. L.A., what do you think is going on at the Skinwalker Ranch? Well, Skinwalker Ranch, in my opinion, is an open portal. It's a gateway. Uh, it's, and that's why when you see the circles like this, that's, in my opinion, that's uh, denoting that this is a gateway. This is a portal between, between the second heaven and what we see here. Uh, this is the first heaven. Second heaven right now is where the dragon and his fallen angels reside. Third heaven is where the most high God is. So the three heavens have different um, have different paradigms, I should say, if I can use that word, maybe. Uh, different, different rules of engagement, perhaps, is another way to put it. But the fallen angels right now uh, have the ability to go between the second heaven and the first heaven between their abode and where we are. And so Skimwalker Ranch more than likely is a gateway there, is a portal. Um, ceremonies have been done there. If it is a gateway, and I firmly believe it is, then stuff from the other side is going in and out of there all the time. I've been at other gateways, Amora Mora down in Peru, absolutely a gateway. Um, there's a gateway on Catalina Island. I don't know the precise location of it, but there's definitely a gateway there. There are gateways and open portals all the way, all around the world. Uh, the biblical text for that would be when the angel fights with the prince of Persia. All right. How does that work? And the prince of Persia will not let him through. Why can't the angel just do an end run? So here's the prince of Persia. Why can't the angel come in this way or this way or this way? He's got to go through that gateway because that's the gateway to where he wants to go on the earth. Just saying. There's a lot that we don't know. That's conjecture on my part. But it's based on the fact that the angel has to go and get help. He's got to get reinforcements, which opens up another can of worms. Reinforcements, well, how do these, how do these entities fight? How do they fight? Is it flaming swords? Is it laser swords? Is it? We, we don't know. Do they throw balls of light at each other? We have no idea. We're not told. 
But in places where we do see angels, um, we know in the Garden of Eden, there was a flaming sword that turned every which way. We know that when Joshua meets the Lord of hosts before they go into the, to, um, Canaan, which is the pre-incarnate Jesus, a theophany once again, they, that angel, the Lord, Jesus, has a drawn sword. So how do they fight? And they can't be killed because they're eternal entities or eternal beings. So it opens up, as with all this, sometimes one question leads to three more. Welcome to my world. That's usually the case in this field. When you have one question, it leads to so many more. When you have one answer, you have more questions. Does your research indicate that the watchers simply observe or do they get involved in dramatic world events where they no longer watch but act? And do they have warring counterparts from the second heaven you mentioned being the realm of the dragon? Well, they that's a really good question and I don't have all the answers to that. I know that when they came in the days of Jared, they interacted here. They took wives, it's plural. They went into the wives in a biblical sense. They created this race of being known as the Nephilim. So they were here. Um, and they were here for the second, third, fourth, fifth incursion right up to modernity. Um, but, the, but the game changes. And the dragon's always kind of massaging the game a little bit and trying to get a foothold, trying to get his, his agenda through. But the cross changed everything. The cross changed everything. And it was game over at the cross. So he's on borrowed time. He knows that. And that's why we're headed. We're ramping up. We're watching the whole globe ramping up into the into the tribulation period. We're not there yet. I don't believe the church will see it. But my gosh, we're in the birth pangs. Another area of research for you has been looking into the topic of elongated skulls. During your research, have you made any considerable connections between the skulls and the Nephilim? Well, yes. I mean, in, in my opinion, um, we've got, and you can see the right behind me, the two skulls. Uh, these are models made by Joe Taylor. Uh, they're one-to-one -one models from, from Paracas. And... Um, what you'll see is that there are genetic anomalies. In fact, in our sixth uh, film in the series, I'm a Trail of a Nephilim, we show medical doctors, surgeons, anthropologists, archaeologists, optometrists, chiropractors, looking at these skulls and saying, whatever this is, it's genetic. That's genetic right there. That's genetic. So if it's genetic, what are we looking at? And this ties right back into the Nephilim. Are they the Nephilim? I can't say that with 100% certainty. What I can say is, in my opinion, it is. The, uh, the DNA evidence that we obtained showed a Middle Eastern haplogroup for the female side, the mitochondrial DNA. Um, it showed a female side going from the Middle East or Eastern Europe, also the Black Sea. The nuclear DNA, allegedly, coming from the paternal side of the equation was there was nothing in the gen bank. In other words, it was an unknown, which is exactly what I would expect to find, an unknown primate. So it creates what you, I got the hiccup, so no. What you see in the back, I hope this doesn't last too long. What you see in the background, um, that's, that's what you get. And these were down in Peru. They show up in Peru about, 3,500 years ago, fits the timeline of the conquest of Canaan. Uh, there are genetic anomalies, like I said. There were no sagittal suture, which runs here like this. The orbits, the eye sockets are 25 to 30% bigger. The brain capacity is 30% larger. The smoking gun is the foramen magnum, where the skull attaches to the, to the spinal column. So it should be in the middle. It should be in the middle of a skull. But with the Paracas, it's all the way in the back, all the way in the back. So it should be here. It's all the way in the back. 
would the larger cranial space denote a larger brain, in your opinion? And there are examples of Egyptian rulers with their elongated craniums. So what's the origin then of the genetics for this species? Is it the Nephilim? Well, the, 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 remember, the Nephilim are the progeny, the product of fallen angels and women of Earth, creating a hybrid being known as the Nephilim. So you have fallen angels, earthly women, human women coming together, performing the sex act. Don't ask me how that works, but that's what it is. And um, they create these, these children. People go, well, you know, angels will be like the angels. They're not going to have, you don't, you don't know that. There's something called metaschist monocyte. These entities have the ability to transform their appearance into pretty much anything that they want. So what we're looking at here is mysterious. It's very deeply troubling deeply troubling because uh, we're in the window of time where we see this type of stuff happen. How do I know this? This is the book, but you can watch the film by going to our YouTube channel and opening up any of the chat, chat boxes, text box below. And in the text box right below the, the video, you'll see a link for the free UFO film. In that, watch Al Matthews. He became the centerpiece of the entire film because he had an encounter with a woman who I believe was a hybrid, a modern day Nephilim, was not human. No way, no way. And I won't give away the farm by telling you what happened, but it's a free film, so you can go there yourself. What made you think that this woman was a hybrid? What kind of characteristics gave it away for you? She wore these dark sunglasses. They were almost like swimmer's goggles. And when Al was, was with her and her friend, she took off the dark, dark glasses, and she sat on Al's lap. And I stopped the camera, and I said, Al, is this normal behavior? Would you allow her? You have a girlfriend. Why are you allowing this woman to sit on your lap? And she picks up his, sh his shirt and rubs his chest and goes, wow, you're, you're really well preserved. So this is UFO brain fog. And as she leans forward to kiss him, Al pushes the woman away. When he pushes her away, the eyes go, dwang. The eyes shape shift. They change color. They change shape. And uh, she lets out the most evil laugh you've ever heard in your life, according to Al. And that's when Al fled the scene. So there were other things. I don't want to give away, you know, the, the spoiler alert. But they were, when she's in the elevator with him, there's some stuff there that happens in the elevator. Very, very alarming. And there's no way that she would know those things. So in my opinion, she was a hybrid entity. And uh, Al had a very close encounter. My goodness, if that were to happen to me, I think I would be pretty frightened. Now, there are a handful of conventional explanations for the elongated skulls, and some of them seem unlikely. What have you been able to discard as explanations with your research? Well, the idea that all these... Let me let me let me get a prop here for you real quick. The prevailing paradigm in archaeological circles is that these skulls that we see here are cradle headboarded. Here here we've got an elongated skull. It's a model uh, made by Joe Taylor. Uh, it's it's found in Paracas. Notice the elongation, the great elongation. So modern day archaeologists insist that all they take a child, they bind the head of a child and they create this form. We're saying not so fast, citizen. If that's the case, then why do we see this? Why are the orbits 25 to 30% larger than a normal human being? Why is the pupillary distance between, between here and here, why is it 45 millimeters instead of 65 millimeters, or 42 millimeters instead of 64 or 65 millimeters? Why is that? Why is it that there is no sagittal suture so this is a frontal suture right here, okay? There should be a suture that goes from here all the way back. There's not. There's not even a vestige of a suture. It doesn't exist. And so, you know, you're looking at anomalies that cradle deformation, cranial deformation, cradle headboardies will not be able to account for. However, the smoking gun is here. This is the foramen magnum. Now, the white interior here that's that was that's not the way it looks. That's clay that Joe Taylor put in there. So when he puts a dowel in this thing, 
he's got something to, to hold on to. But it, it would be your spinal column would attach to the perimeter all the way around like this. All right. So there's there's the perimeter. So that's it would be an open hole. All that all that cabling that that runs through the center of our spinal column, all those nerves, everything that they go up into the brain. And I mean, you want to talk about, you know, it's amazing. This foramen magnum should be here, right there. Should be in the center of the skull. It's all the way to the back. If it's any, if it's any further in the back, it's outside the skull. See that? Let me try to hold it steady here. So you can't move the foramen magnum in, in utero. Can't do it. So we're, and of course, when you show that. Don't bother me with the facts. There is, I say this every single day on my own show, I'm a trail of the Nephilim. There is a hidden history that's been deliberately obfuscated from the peoples of the world. There's no doubt. We, we've been lied to over and over and over again. The idea of Darwinism is a total joke. It doesn't work. It never has worked. It just, it's a house of cards. But it's still taught, isn't it? In every, every school district in the country, they teach all about Charlie Darwinism. Charlie Darwin. So, you know what? We we proved it, not not conclusively, but the nuclear DNA, which came from these skulls. There was no nothing in the gen bank, nothing at all. It there was there was no. They couldn't match it with anything. All they can say is unknown primate. So this guy here, in my opinion, might have been might have must. It would necessitate a longer neck to balance the skull because, you know, once again, it should be here. Let me try to, it should be here, but it's all the way in the back. It's all the way here. So in order to, in order to uh, compensate for it, this entity might have had a longer neck. Well, the Anakim is called long necks. That's what it's translated as, Anakim long neck. Isn't it an interesting Anakim skin, uh, Anakim, what is it, Luke Skywalker? Anakim Skywalker, not making that up either, right? Interesting choice of words, but there you go. Orbits, lack of sagittal suture, and the big smoking gun, of course, the foramen magnum. Also, the, the jaw is incredibly robust. So is the zygomatic arch on this side of the skull. Very large, pronounced zygomatic arch. And then look in here. Look, look at that. Look, look at the cheekbones. We don't have these features. So if you can, you know, you can go on my uh, on my streaming site, uh, streaming streaming.lamarzulli.net, streaming.lamarzulli.net. You can watch uh, uh, basically the DNA results. It's episode six. It'll blow your mind. It'll blow your mind. Guaranteed, it'll blow your mind. LA, hang tight. We are coming up against a break. We'll be right back. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNX DB, Kansas City, Missouri. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? UnX Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNX DB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie Kay. That's unxmedia.com. Howdy folks, this is Lou Elizondo and you are listening to my very good friend Christina Gomez on Shifting the Paradigm. Hi folks, these uncertain times can cause uncertain gut slowdown. Worry and fear can wreak havoc on our digestion, making it hard to feel optimum. Bloating, less energy, and occasional constipation can slow you down in your daily activity. Try Life Change Tea to get the tea.com. Life Change Tea can help get things moving so you can get that boost of energy you need. Life Change Tea helps protect and defend your health from intruders. It's a weird time right now. 
with all the uncertainty, so gear up and defend your health. Where do you go to purchase? Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. The specials are on the front page, and we have numerous supplements to help combat intruders. It's time to take charge of our health and to feel better in life. It's time to live. Again, GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Hi, hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new Unex Network. And you're locked on Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on On the the X. You ever notice your home doesn't smell as fresh as it used to? It's not you. As homes age, paint and carpet, they absorb all different kinds of odors, seemingly impossible to get rid of over time. But the Eden Pure Thunderstorm Air Purifier is guaranteed to eliminate those odors. The thunderstorm sends out the OH3 molecules into the air. It seeks out those nasty smells, germs, and mold and destroys them at the source. If you're like me, maybe you have a child who suffers from allergies or asthma. It can keep those so-called trigger smells away. No expensive filters to replace. Its compact size allows you to plug it into any room of the house and go. Other purifiers can cost up to $600 for one unit. You can get several thunderstorms for a fraction of that. With the discount code MATT, you'll save an additional 10 bucks. Go to EdenPureDeals.com. Enter the discount code MATT to save $10 off their lowest sale price. Again, go to EdenPureDeals.com. That's promo code MATT. You'll get free shipping. EdenPureDeals.com. Promo code MATT. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Are you thinking about purchasing a wood-fired heating or cooking appliance but don't know where to start? The new book, Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking, will guide you through the process and make the decision much easier. Find out about wood stoves, wood-burning fireplace inserts, masonry heaters, cook stoves, brick ovens, and more. Learn about operation and maintenance, buying and storing wood, even how to make your own charcoal. A bonus section includes delicious recipes for cooking in a wood-burning oven, grill, tandoori oven, or smoker. The wise homeowner, prepper, or homesteader will have the ability to heat their home with wood when the power goes out or to save money on increasing gas bills. Wood-Fired Heating and Cooking is available at Amazon. Visit www.woodfiredpub.com for more information. That's woodfiredpub.com. This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks Program right here on KUNX. And right now, you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez. talking about elongated skulls what has been the most obscure stretch of the imagination you've heard thus far explaining the elongated skulls uh uh, i've I've heard all sorts of stuff most most of them just tell us most archaeologists insist that all this is the result of cranial deformation cradle headboarding but you know i think we've proven that that there's something else going on but they refuse to take a look at there's a, a museum. I won't mention the name of it. They won't even. They won't even let me look at their material anymore. Uh, they're afraid of me. Why? Why are you so afraid of me? I, I've offered you a thousand dollars to let me come in and just look at your skulls. Why are you so afraid? Why? Because they're probably all ardent Darwinists, and they're insisting this is all the result of cranial deformation, cradle headboarding. It has nothing to do with the Nephilim and 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 the, the supernatural world or anything else. That Marzulli guy is a troublemaker. No, I'm just looking for the truth. I'm just looking for the truth. Our DNA evidence shows something else is going on. We have medical doctor after medical doctor, surgeons, uh, optometrists, archaeologists, anthropologists. They all come on the record and say the same thing. This is genetic. We are looking at a genetic anomaly. There they are back there. 
And that's what it is. And what this does, and the reason why it troubles them, it points back to the veracity of the biblical prophetic narrative, which says that the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards. When the sons of God took wives from whomever they chose and went into them in the biblical sense, these were men of renown. And that's where we, they don't like that because it points back to the supernatural worldview. And remember in Darwinism, no supernatural, no God, no right, no wrong, no good, no evil, no prophecy, nothing. There's just mindless evolution for billions of years. Oh, really? Or are we fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of our creator? Of course, I uphold the latter to the nines. And that's why we're on the trail. And that's what it's all about. It's really about pushing that envelope and asking the right questions. Peru has a lot of ancient stories about gods, giants, and star beings, along with other mysteries such as the Nazca Lines and the Stargate at Hayumarca. You also research other mysteries along with being a UFO researcher. What mysteries did you look into when you visited Peru? Well, that's a three-hour conversation, and I don't really have time to get into that. That's a whole other show, and I'd be more than happy to come back later and talk to you about that. But um, there are the vestiges, not only in Peru, but all throughout the United States, of something else that's going on that does not fit the narrative at all. Can you go into a little bit more detail on that, just for a few minutes? Basically, when you when you look at the a place called Sacsayhuaman, which huge megalithic stones, 60, 70, 80, 100 tons, and you're fitted together without mortar, ashlar construction, and they're polygonal shapes. They're not, in fact, let me just show you what I'm talking about here. So this is a, a really good example of, there's my close-up. <laughs> This is from my book, On the Trail of the Nephilim. And I was there. You're trying to tell me the Inca made this? Nonsense. Ah, and this is what the wall looked like. See the little people below? <laughs> See that? So when you're there, and when I, when I take people there, I tell them, touch the wall. You're touching the fingerprints of the supernatural, because that's what it is. This, it makes no sense. The Inca were not master stone builders. They did not build that wall. So if they didn't do it, you got two choices. Either people from some other planet, like off-world ancient aliens types, which we hear every Friday night, or this is the tech technology, fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture, which is a phrase I coined a number of years ago. It's exactly what it is. Fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture. And that kind of architecture is just stunning. And plus, Peru is such a beautiful location to visit. I know you're very restricted on your time. So my last question is, in several books and lectures, you talk about the hyperdimensional curtain. Can you share with us what that means? Well, this goes back into the gateways and the portals, like you asked me about Skinwalker Ranch. There's a, there's a gateway, there's a portal there. So these entities move in and out. Through, through these gateways, through these portals. And um, some of these gateways and some of these portals have never been uh, challenged or, or brought under the jurisdiction of the good guys. Uh, all, we, all we need to do is go over to Iran and that Prince of Persia has never been deposed last time I checked. He's still running the show. If you go to Portugal, that ancient goddess worship, Mora, is still alive and well and, and running roughshod over what's going on in there. So these, um, these gateways, uh, shamans access them. People who take ayahuasca can access them, but we're forbidden to access them because we're not equipped to deal with the entities that inhabit these places. LA, thank you so much for being so generous with your time. Where can people continue to follow your research online? Bunch of different places, lamarzuli.net. You've got that posted up there. Um, we are on YouTube, which is on the trail of a Nephilim. We do a daily show there. That's my YouTube channel, LA Marzuli. We're also on PTL Network Friday nights at 11. Uh, that's East Coast time, 8 o'clock on Pacific. 
on the trail of a Nephilim. It's a broadcast quality 30 minute show. So that's where you can find us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christina. Appreciate it. It was fantastic to hear Mr. Marzulli's research into the different fields he has looked into. He opened my mind to the possibility of the Nephilim. And while I did a lot of research into the topic specifically for today's show, there was still so much I learned. L.A. took these complex and intense stories with such ease that it was easy to follow, even for those that might have little to no background knowledge on the biblical scriptures, such as myself. It is unfortunate that the time was cut short, but I would love to have him on again in the future to continue diving deep into his research. For the remaining time, I have my good friend and head science writer for The Debrief, Chris Plain. Chris, how are you? Christina, great. Thanks for having me on. It's been a while. It has been. And you've written a lot of fantastic articles lately for the debrief. And there was a bunch that really caught my attention. Awesome. What never fails to hook me in is anything involving the Great Pyramids of Giza. On March 9th, you wrote about, Will Cosmic Rays Reveal the Secrets of the Pyramids? What can you tell us about your findings when creating this article? This is a really, really exciting uh, project that's underway right now, Christina. So a lot of people might have known back in 2016, uh, there was a project called Scan Pyramids. And what they did was they wanted to look inside the Great Pyramid of Giza and see what else was in there besides the areas we already know about. Of course, if you want to look inside something that's made of uh, granite and limestone, mostly limestone, you can't use x-rays. They don't really pass deep enough. You can't use uh, ultrasound or microwaves or any of the other things we normally use, a ground penetrating radar, to look inside stone. So what they did with that first program that's leading to this new one is they set up uh, muon detectors. Now, without getting too deep into the weeds of the physics, basically, in outer space, cosmic rays are constantly pelting our atmosphere. So when those cosmic rays slam into the atmosphere, a lot of them will uh, com com uh, collide with other matter and create these things called muons, which are a subatomic particle. And it's going really fast, and it's a high-energy particle. So it rips right through the pyramid stone. And depending on what it slams into inside the stone, it'll die or, or extinguish itself at certain points. If you put a muon detector on the other side of those rays coming through, you can start picking up those uh, interactions the same way an X-ray film pictures up the x-rays going through a body and hitting bone or, or, or ligaments or whatever. So what they did was they put these muon detectors all around the pyramid and they scanned uh, for many months and slowly but surely what they found was a couple of interesting. Uh, first of all, it just shows all the interior structure we know. But what they found was above the Grand Gallery, which is that big, long, angular hallway inside the pyramid, they found a chamber or some sort, what they described as a void, above the Grand Gallery. And it's a big, open space. They can tell it's open. Now, they can't tell the size of it or the shape of it exactly because of the type of detection. But it was such a big uh, discovery uh, documentaries were made out of it. If you have HBO, you can go watch Scan the Pyramids. And they did a whole documentary about this really amazing find. So what this new group is doing, this group is called uh, Exploring the Great, Great Pyramid, or e EGP. And it's a group of scientists and researchers. And they said, let's take that award-winning research from 2016 and let's take it to the next level. Let's get these really super powerful, super advanced muon detectors. Let's put them all around the pyramid. Let's move them periodically to get better angles, just the way you would move like a, a solar panel to get more sunlight. And move these detectors around the pyramid, and they will create basically muon tomography. They'll basically create a map 
of the inside of the pyramid. And this should do a number of things. First and foremost, it should confirm the void. It should also give a lot more detail to it. So maybe the edges, if they're square and it looks like a structure, or if it is just an open space within the stone that has kind of become created over time. Also, uh, at least some scientists have said they might be able to spot individual artifacts in there, depending on the size, shape, and density. The other big breakthrough they're expecting from this Explore the Great Pyramids pro project is the ability to image uh, junctures and cutoffs and interfaces in the construction of the pyramid. So you could see where one stone meets another, or you could see where two large pieces come together at an angle, or you can see where something was cut off. And hopefully, because what's amazing, and I'm sure you know this, Christina, we still don't know how those things were built. For all their grandiosity, for all the millennia they've been parked in the same spot, there is no documentation. Even all the ancient writings and the uh, hieroglyphs from the Egyptians, there's no drawings of people building these pyramids or what tools they used. But if you could go into a building and you could look at where the wood's cut off and where the metal's cut and where the rivets are put, you could kind of figure out how a building was built. Well, that's what they're hoping to do with the pyramid is confirm that void, maybe determine that it's a big structure, maybe find other voids within their other rooms that are hidden, but more importantly, maybe really lend some clues as to how these things were built. That is so exciting. And you would think that because these pyramids have been here for so long and that everything's been discovered, but yet scientists are still going in and learning new things or finding new things in these pyramids. Yeah, now, you can't you can't dig into them. You know, they're yeah. uh, the last remaining uh, vestiges of the seven wonders of the ancient world. You can't uh, blow them up or, or explore them the way we would normally with archaeology is dig in there. So, yeah, using 21st century technology to peer inside something that's almost 4,000 years old. And that's what makes science so much fun is, is following this process. Before I continue with other things you've written about, how do you come up with writing about this broad spectrum of topics several times a day. What is the inspiration or in other terms, what inspires you to write all these different topics? You know, Christina, uh, when I was uh, first interviewed by MJ Benias, one of the founders of The Debrief, to come on board and write here, uh, I'm a novelist. People know that I have a few novels out for sale and a couple on their way. And uh, uh, I do other writing outside. I occasionally write a screenplay or a TV episode or things like that. Um, but I had never really written about news. But this was the stuff I read every day. And I, I when talking to MJ, uh, he, first of all, he was clear they had a lot of people writing about uh, UFOs and UAPs, one of the things that made the debris popular. <clears throat> but they would really like somebody to write more about science and technology. And as I pointed out, it's not my background. My education from UCLA is in political science. But this is an area I'm heavily interested in, something I've followed my entire life. <clears throat> so basically, he asked me, would you come on and write about the same things you're reading about every day? So there are breakthroughs in science that maybe aren't my cup of tea. Sometimes things about the, the metaverse or new medications or things that are really significant, impressive breakthroughs that don't really tickle my interest. But I found that those that that have a mystery component to it or a mystery thread, you know, a lot of what I write about is the search for life in the galaxy and uh, the search for extraterrestrial life, search for Martian life, uh, microscopic life, search for life on other planets. And that's because of the mystery component, something we just don't know. Same with these things, writing about the pyramids. Uh, I mean, I, I wrote an article recently about do spiders fly using electricity? And uh, that's just because that's something I would read myself. If I was flipping through a science or technology news uh, site, or I was going through the, the news releases like people like me do, if you report on this, you get to go through uh, press releases and see what different researchers are working on. These are the topics I would read about anyway. These are the articles I read about anyway. 
And that's what they've encouraged me. You know, uh, Micah Hanks, who's our current editor-in-chief over at The Debrief, that's what he encouraged me to do. He said, Chris, take those stories that you're interested in, that you find curious, and that's what you write about. Because the readers that read it, they'll share your curiosity, and they will see that that you want to know what's going on, too. So I, I think that's where you and I overlap so much, too, Christina. You know, I like to watch Mysteries with a History, and I like to be involved with your show because it's asking questions. It's trying to understand these bigger, complex mysteries. And, and that's what a lot of science is about. And, and that's the stuff I find the most interesting. I think the most exciting thing about astronomy is finding potential signs of life. And a hot topic right now is Mars. And just recently, the Perseverance rover might have found a flower on the surface. Can you explain that? I mean, is that something we should be excited about? Or is there more to this story? Uh, the term flower is being used because of the appearance of the artifact. What it really is, it's, it's a chunk of sand and dirt. It's what we call a concretion and what scientists call a concretion. And uh, it's, it's very small, but it sure as heck looks like a little flower, or a little cactus. What it was really proof of and indicative of is these long, wet periods in Mars past that we've always assumed existed. And a lot of rover research in the last 20 years, as well as orbitable platforms like uh, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or these other satellites, have built this huge, impressive body of evidence that says, uh, pretty indisputably, Mars was wet in the past. It was wet likely for millions, if not hundreds of millions of years, had entire lakes and rivers on the surface. And we know on Earth, if you want to find life, the best place to look is somewhere where it's wet, right? Uh, even if you uh, you get water on the boards in, in your bathroom in between the walls, you'll grow, grow mold or something. You know, like that's where you look for life, especially microscopic life. So that discovery of the flower was neat because it was real. It was something we really found, a physical object that looks like a flower, and it also indicates that water was there. It wasn't actually a flower. It was just a uh, <clears throat> a little clump of sand and dirt that shaped itself like that over millions of years. But I can tell you something else that's going on on Mars right now that's really exciting. This started about 10 days ago and should be done any day. <clears throat> As, as a lot of people know, the Perseverance rover is in Jezero Crater looking for signs of life. And one of the things it's doing is when it sees a particularly tantalizing rock or patch of soil, it will drill into the rock or it will scoop into the soil. And then it will put it inside a little um, uh, safety tube, a little uh, a test tube, and cache it away inside the rover and it's basically grabbing the, the most exciting most tantalizing samples putting those away inside of itself for safekeeping with the idea that sometime around the end of this decade 2029 or so right now uh nasa and the european space agency they're working on it right now they want to send up uh, a, another rover and a ship called mars sample return and without getting too deep into how that'll work, it, they want to send thing up there, drive over to this rover, say thank you for grabbing those samples and saving for us, scooping them on board, and bringing them back to Earth so we can look at them in a lab. Because I think that's the biggest frustration for people like me that follow this and follow the various uh, NASA and other projects on Mars, is you go, all right, we got a rover up there. It's searching around, it's got all kinds of instruments, and it'll find something, but it never seems to say yes or no, I found a microscopic life, I found a little amoeba or some little thing. And that's because the type of instrumentation we can put on these things can't do that very easily. But it's the type of thing we can determine back here in a lab on Earth. So as we speak right now, Perseverance Rover is looking to set a speed and distance record. It's traveling all the way around the one edge of the crater, heading for what they call an ancient river delta. And it's just basically a spot where water accumulated millions and millions of years ago. And the goal is, 
they're convinced that if you're going to find life, I mean, Jezero Crater was picked as a great spot. And this is the sweet spot within the sweet spot, if you will, this river delta. And it's so tantalizing that one of the mission engineers said this, and I put this in the article, that we have abandoned all other science activities so we can focus solely on driving. They are effectively right where they are making a mad dash for this river delta so they can find the most tantalizing life targets, scoop them up, put them in tubes, stash them away for safekeeping, and sometime in the within the decade, we're going to go up and get them and bring them back to Earth. And these samples, these may be those magic ones. These may very well be those first samples that come back to Earth, are looked at in the lab, and they say, we found microscopic life here. When can we expect to see that data? So the Mars sample return mission is something that they've been working on for a long time. And uh, I've written a couple articles about it. As I noted, the largest European, you know, the European Space Agency and America's Nor uh, NASA, they're working together on the project. And there's a lot of hurdles. You have to put a, a, a craft in orbit in Mars, something we've done. They need to send something down the land, something we've done a couple of times now. It needs to come over to the rover and get the samples from it, stash it away. Then it needs to take off, go back up to the orbiter, and then it sends a craft back to Earth with the samples back to Earth. So there's a bunch of steps and a bunch of maneuvers to it. But we've seen recently with the Perseverance lander, with the uh, Ingenuity helicopter, or even with the James Webb telescope that had literally hundreds of checkpoints, what they called single fail checkpoints, things that if it didn't work, that was it. The, the, the thing was done. The project was done. And each one of those single fail checkpoints made it through. And the James Webb is up running. The Ingenuity helicopter has, has flown. Perseverance is doing its science. So uh, we, uh, the expectation is, Christina, ideally around 2029. For those of us that have been following this a long time, we'll tell you maybe another year or two after that. But sometime within a decade. We're going to go up there. We're going to grab all of those samples. And then Perseverance already has about four samples on board. I think it, it took an empty one of empty atmosphere. It took one of some generic rock and uh, dust. And then it's taken a couple tantalizing life samples as well that they think might have microscopic past or present life in it. And so once it grabs these next few, there will probably be one or two other targets while the rover's still operating, that it caches away. But yeah, hopefully in your my lifetime, we're going to see those come back, uh, hopefully not too far in the future of our lifetime. And those things will be looked at in the lab, and we'll hear once and for all if, uh, if they found microscopic life on Mars. Currently, my favorite thing when it comes to following the topic is when scientists and astronomers state their discoveries of finding potential signs of life on different planets. You talk about a new discovery of complex organic molecules found within a planetary disk. Can you go into detail on what it was that the article entailed? Sure. Uh, this is actually a pretty significant discovery for the hunt for extraterrestrial life. Uh, basically, Christina, if you think about before a planet's form, uh, typically, uh, as far as astronomers understand it, you'll have like a sun in the center and then you have this big flat disk of debris that's orbiting around the sun. And over time, that disk kind of coalesces into the individual planets. And that's how they believe our solar system uh, was created. Typically, in that environment, you can find individual organic molecules, something like carbon or something that's like a basic building block of life, oxygen. And our telescopes pick that up all the time. But typically, in those planetary disks that are that, that stellar disk that's going to create planets, we don't pick up anything complex. And scientists have pretty much assumed that those more complex molecules that are building blocks of life, things like methane and ethane and these more like complex strings of peptides, that those things are built after the planet collapses. 
and after the the disc creates it. But in this particular case, they found two different complex organic molecules in the disc of a planet. One of them has nine uh, atoms on it. So it's a very big, very complex building block of life just floating out there in this disc of planetary dust and rock. That is unbelievable. So exciting. And to be able to witness this, scientists freshly discovering these types of things, I think we're living in a beautiful age to follow up about what's happening outside of our planet. Chris, thank you so much for being with me here today. Where can people find you online? Uh, Christina, the best place to read science from me is at the debrief.org, as you know. And then you have my Twitter up there. Uh, at plain underscore fiction. Those are the two places. If you go to either one of those places, you'll find me. And if you want more of me, those places will lead you to more of me. Chris, thank you once again for coming on and talking to us about these groundbreaking articles. There is so much to look forward to when it comes to the exploration of space and even the exploration of artifacts here on our home world. Like I said, anything that involves the pyramids or potential signs of life in our galaxy and universe, you can count on me to read up all about it. Thank you to everyone that has watched or listened to this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. <laughs>